Welcome to a Beeson Community Interview. I'm Jamie, and I'm here with Sammy Miguez to talk about the role metrics have to play in a successful SSI transformation. Hi, Sammy. Hello. Briefly to recap, I'm going to be throwing around the term SSI 2.0 a lot as kind of placeholder for future SSI programs. Mm -hmm. Can you elaborate a little bit on that and provide some, some clarity about what people mean when they throw this term around? Let me start at the top and be brief, and then we'll get back to what I think maybe the meat of the question is. Back in, say, 1999, for lack of a better year, you know, we realized that we had to start doing risk management relative to the security and not just the quality of the software that we were sort of routinely emitting from our development programs as most big organizations are want to do, they made a program and they put somebody in charge and, and that was a risk management program. And we called those software security initiatives and we started measuring them with the BSIM by way of actually looking at what they were doing and how they were doing it. And in those days, and a lot still today, they were effectively emulating what they already knew which was host security, network security, people security, communications security, physical security, and so guns, gates, and guards. And so they built big programs with big governance, with big gates at which we had big tests, and it was a whole lot of hurry up and wait, finger pointing, and let's just say unclear responsibilities. Well, today, that doesn't really get you anywhere anymore. It's too much friction. It's like driving around with your brakes on, as someone said recently, and I believe that was you. Uh -huh. And it's not helping us get to the next generation of what the business needs, which is something that's more integrated, something that's much more fluid, something that's much more resilience-oriented than just quality or security, something where there's a shared responsibility model, blameless postmortems, automate first mentality, and a variety of other things. So then the question is, well, what are some metrics that help show what we're doing and how we're doing it? And I'm going to not give you a specific answer yet, because I think we'll talk some more about some specific things. I want to start with the basics. The basics are this. Always start with the basics. What do you really need to know? What question do you need to answer? And some other basic things. Do you need leading indicators? Do you need to know if something is going to break? Do you need lagging indicators? Do you need to know if something broke? And so really today, with respect to metrics, you have to start with your way, your methodology, your culture, you have to understand the critical points in it, the constraints, if you want to use some, some DevOps terminology. And most importantly, what are the things that indicate that the folks in your organization who have some responsibility for software security are more productive than they used to be in putting out code that is acceptably secure? You can measure if the code is simply more secure, but if you're creating more friction to do that, you're not necessarily helping the business. So what do folks need to do with respect to metrics? They need to determine if they've created the scenario, the situation, the productivity required to routinely emit acceptably secure software in a way that helps them meet current business objectives. That exact metrics are gonna be different for every organization, but those are the metrics that they need today to help understand whether their digital transformation is really working as opposed to just how much effort we're putting into it. So you said that the business priorities of every business and what they need to do should be at the forefront of teams' minds as they select it. And so that's going to make it unique for every organization. But are there any commonalities for organizations who are looking to undergo this transformation, this move ahead to move from the big discrete gates and big things to something a little bit more organic and natural? Yes, whether it's Organic and natural is probably a whole other conversation. I would say that there's probably going to be 
a hundred examples of metrics that every organization will have, but they're going to be, let's call them beginner metrics. So a lot of them are going to be pointed at effort. It's like the old days where people used to say, we dropped a million attacks at the firewall. Like, no, you didn't. You know, maybe you dropped a million packets. Okay, we dropped a million packets at the firewall. Okay, but how many of those were you supposed to drop or not supposed to drop? Does it mean anything? And so lots of organizations are going to have effort metrics or even vanity metrics. Look how good we are that are going to be common. They're just not going to be helpful. So what could actually be helpful as you go through this kind of transformation? So let me give you a couple of examples. I think in terms of process alignment, how many times in your value stream, your software development pipeline, or perhaps your governance interaction with your engineering value streams? Did one process try to connect to another process? And I mean business process here. We're not, you know, there's not Unix sockets. And either didn't give the next step the right stuff or the next step wasn't ready for the right stuff. This is really going to help you understand whether you're targeting usability in a good way. It's going to help you understand which pieces of the organization are perhaps going through a digital transformation faster than others. Uh, This will help you understand if the culture is keeping up with the technology. So, this, this view of process alignment is very oriented towards, is this working? And then, of course, for specific pieces of the process, is it working fast enough? Rework rate. You know, we talk about rework all the time. Something gets to the end of the assembly line, someone plugs it into a jig, it doesn't work, maybe we try to fix it, that's rework. Well, in an automated supply chain, in an automated development environment, in an automated value stream, rework is any time you had to take an artifact back a step. That could be anything, like a pull request failed, or a a build failed, or anything where we have to go back a step. So rework rate, all up and down a value stream, is a really, really good indicator of whether your transformation from people-oriented guns, gates, and guards, is successfully transitioning to something digital where things just work. They're all in process. They're all automated, whether it's infrastructure as code or whatever, it doesn't matter. So that's the second one. I'll just give you a couple more without explaining them in detail. Things like event visibility. How often is something able to fail silently? Man, that's that's a really big problem. Nothing, including people should ever be able to fail silently. Resilience, you know, how easily are we able to cause chaos in our systems and how rapidly are we able to respond to chaos in our systems? And then the traditional mean time to repair, but mean time to repair at every place where we have a resilience issue, which we discovered through event visibility where we saw rework rate, possibly due to process alignment. So you can see that these are not all individual metrics. They are tied together to tell a story about how our SSI 2.0 is really working. So these are a handful. There's probably eight to 10 more that would help you build a real, real story. Okay. Well, I heard when you're going through the use of the metrics, I heard help you a lot, where we're primarily talking to the people who are going to be tasked with deciding which metrics are chosen and and measured, but they aren't the only consumer of these metrics. Mm -hmm. So there are the traditional audiences, the senior leadership that you send metrics reports up to say, we're doing a good job, we're doing a bad job, we need more resources, we need more time, or here's how you can make the board happy with the efforts that we're doing. There are metrics that you send to developers, here's your bug count, go fix. And then there are metrics for the internal AppSec team that says, am I doing a good job or not? Are the audiences for metrics changing to include potentially automated audiences, if you think of automated decisions as an audience mm-hmm. of metrics? Yeah, so I think there's there's five really good questions all rolled up there, and they're really good questions. I'll, I'll answer the last one. I think we've come to the point where 
with respect to instrumentation, bots are effectively first class citizens. So we have to do that. We have to believe that. We have to culturally work that way. Otherwise, we can't have, for example, security sign off in automation. We can do CI and CD, continuous integration and continuous delivery, but we can't do CD, continuous deployment, without some kind of oracle that says, check, 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 all these metrics, all these values, all these little knobs in automation, unless we can do that. And so, so the years of humans understand kind of, sort of, they're pretty bad at it, actually, what yellow means or light orange or red plus unicorn equals sideways check mark. But this doesn't work for bots at all. Either it's 1.9999999 or it's 2.000001 or the bot doesn't know what to do. And so this whole idea of getting metrics that are fairly precise algorithms to give exact numbers to bots is a really big deal. And it's really one of the ways forward. The metrics themselves, especially for humans, every metric has to answer a question. If it doesn't answer a question, then it's just something you generated because you had too much free time. What is the impact of our training program on these kinds of bugs using these frameworks in this kind of greenfield environment? This metric answers that question. Any metric that doesn't answer a question, a business or a technical question, again, it's just you might as well be mining Bitcoin with that time because there was no reason to produce that metric. Okay. So I'm going to double back. You mentioned that there were a couple of interesting questions in my long-winded setup. Did you have any thoughts on the way that the audiences themselves might be changing in, in terms of, I guess, what they expect, how you present to them? You've already mentioned changing the metrics that you show, the rework rates and the resilience rates. But are there any other changes to metrics? Because it's not just collection and calculation, it's also presentation. Yeah. So first of all, I did not mean to imply in any way that you asked a long-winded question. That's <laughs> not what I meant. Uh, but but the answer to your to your question here is, is yes. I think what's happening is we have metrics consumers who are more sophisticated today than they used to be. But we also have metrics translators who still aren't as sophisticated as they do need to be. So for example, the CISO, the, the VP of AppSec, the VP of Dev, you know, anyone like that, they sort of understand what they need to make their gut decisions about how things are going. Translating that up to the next level of management to get the right action or the necessary action, I think is still a skill that, well, you know, with all due respect, still a skill that many senior leaders don't have. They came up through the technical ranks, perhaps, and they understand the technical numbers that they need, but turning that into how company X is going to make more money in Asia Pack with widgets that are that are brown with blue stripes instead of blue with brown stripes is that's hard. When you come up through the technical ranks, you don't necessarily understand the business translation layer. When you're spent your whole career in the management ranks, you don't necessarily understand what the technical numbers actually mean. Why can't we just do more faster? So I think what's happening today is we have folks who are asking for things that are already translated. Give me a metric I can show to my boss, my manager. Give me a metric I can show to the board. And when that isn't an appropriate metric, then it just it just causes all sorts of confusion. I think the people who are directly consuming metrics are getting more sophisticated. I think board risk committees are getting more sophisticated, but the supply chain, the metrics supply chain, if you will, hasn't caught up yet. So we're still giving people numbers instead of risk management decision support data, and they don't necessarily know what to do with it. And this is actually slowing down SSI 2.0 instead of helping it go faster. You know what I mean? Yeah. Absolutely. I've been there. It reminds me of the times I've had to send up weekly metrics to people way above my pay grades, several levels up. And so the metrics would go up 
and then they'd come back down and the question would hit every rung of the ladder along the way, usually along the lines of, uh, what does this mean? I am unhappy. No one would ever admit that they were confused, but the underlying subtext would always be, this metric confuses me. Yeah, so how can teams get past that? How can they iterate towards metrics that go from just reporting up numbers that may be confusing or not have context to something that is a decision input? So argue about, reason about, get consensus about the questions. There's no need to report up to anyone uh, how many bugs were found with static analysis on a daily basis. What if we just didn't run the tool today? It found zero bugs. Oh, heads will roll. Well, we didn't, we didn't run it. You know? So maybe it's bugs per M lock. Well, that's a little more interesting because when we do zero, then the number tracks appropriately. But we need to get back to what is the question that that recipient needs to answer in order to do good risk management? Am I spending my money well? Well, I mean, come on, sure. You know, <laughs> am I invested in the market properly? I, uh, who knows, man? Come on. But something a little more like, are these kinds of bugs decreasing when I put this kind of tool in the mix and give feedback to my developers? Ah. Well, what's the metric for that? The metric would be tools found in a particular technology stack for a particular project over time, perhaps based on the mean time to repair for the kinds of bugs that are being fixed and the ability to discover those bugs with the tool. So can we make better, you know, I don't know, struts one, let's pick on something old, better struts stacks with static analysis and dynamic analysis, yes or no? that we can figure out. And that's a question that a manager should ask based on their investment in those tools. Are we getting more secure, dude? Let's come back to a reasonable question for which we can gather measurements, to which we can apply an algorithm to create metrics that answer a reasonable question. We can do that all day long. Okay. So assuming that you're already a pro at picking out the questions and coming up with reasons why the answer is important, which should you spend more effort on? Selecting and defining good data points or presenting metrics in the most concise and actionable manner? Please don't say yes. <laughs> so I view it like a tornado. Sure, you have to start somewhere. And it might be, what are the numbers we already have? Do they make sense to us? Let's look at all of our revenue numbers for the past five years. And maybe suddenly it pops out, hey, look, on Tuesdays, you know, we sell more chicken. I wonder why. And, and then we can start to make questions from there. I think in some other cases, a question will come down possibly from a bad audit finding, a near miss kind of incident an actual incident or something like that, where someone will say, does X happen and what does Y mean? And then we'll go dig out the data. However it starts, we're going to go from data or question to more data, to a more refined question, to more data, to a more refined question. And it's going to get bigger and bigger, like going from the very bottom tip of a tornado up towards the top. Good questions will generate more good questions, which will generate the need for more telemetry instrumentation so that we can get more data, so that we can generate more algorithms, so that we can generate more metrics, which are the answers to the questions. I think for me, it comes down to, we need the top down push, the understanding of what we're asking the organization to do. I need, just say from a compliance perspective, I need this testing done before this software leaves the organization, perhaps as part of some software supply chain risk management. So how often does it happen? How often does it not happen? But the big important questions are, why doesn't it happen on time when it doesn't? Not how often does it happen and how often does it not happen? That's not interesting. Those are just indicators that perhaps something is awry. This is not a metric we can drive the business with. How long does it take us to recover when it doesn't happen as expected? Okay, so mean time to repair, resilience. Now we have some interesting questions about how well the business is working as opposed to just what the business is doing. So I do think you have to start with 
what do you really expect the business to be doing? And then go gather some data. And one of the ways I help executives do that is to start with a little exercise about how do you make money? A lot of it is selling pizza boxes, but it's not that. Maybe there's online ways to buy it with a credit card or something. Maybe you're renting pizza boxes. Maybe you have a managed service that does the log analysis of the pizza boxes. Then specifically for AppSec, what are the ways all AppSec can help make all of that work better, faster, cheaper? And now let's make some metrics to see if that's actually happening. So that's it for the prepared questions I have. Are there any questions that I should have asked or you wish I asked that you could <laughs> you know, answer? <laughs> so I think you asked about metrics in terms of presentation. I do think the metrics world, which is to say people who help people create metrics, I do think we need to do more to help people understand the difference between qualitative and quantitative. I think that's sort of an underserved market. I think it's an undervalued skill. We still have people who ask, on a scale of one to five, how do you feel about X? They assign an ordinal value to one through five, some kind of Likert scale question. They assign one through five. They add up the numbers, divide by the number of questions, and they say, your risk is 2.7. Like. Hmm. Really? I mean, really? So the idea of making qualitative things and turning them into quantitative things and actually making the decision off the quantitative number, I think that's something we need to help the marketplace understand is just sort of fraught with danger because what if four of the questions were a one and one was a five or a 10? You know, what if all of them were threes? and you came out with the same risk score, is it once you converted bad numbers to actual numbers? Do they really mean the same? Are you just sort of fooling yourself? So I think that's a really big place in the market right now where everyone needs to get better. Yeah, no, I've, I've definitely been there where if you come to someone with qualitative metrics, they'll just throw them out if you can't prove them somehow. There was a second topic you were heading into? You asked about what do we need to do different in the area of metrics? How do we help everyone get better at it? Certainly learning how to make better metrics is one part of it. But I think the big thing that's really going to cause a change, and it's hard to imagine what the change will be right now, but is this whole thing of automate first, digital guardrails, all these kinds of things. So if you think in terms of continuous threat modeling, but you don't think of threat modeling the way you would traditionally think of it, where you're looking at an architecture to find bugs, imagine it more as you're looking at a continuous flow of activity to find non-adherence. Okay, well, how do you do that? Well, you have, if you want to, you know, sort of put it in practical terms, you have a whole bunch of if then else's that execute every second, or every few seconds. And it's, you know, kind of like your car, you know, the check engine light. If this, then don't turn the check engine light on. If this, then don't turn the check engine light on. And, and it does that every millisecond, the entire time your car is on until one time it goes, oh, turn the check engine light on. And so, what are those if then else's? They're effectively metrics. Now, some of those need to go to humans, but some of them are really just in guardrails. And all they really do in a lot of cases is affect the velocity, not just the speed, but the velocity, which is a vector quantity, speed and direction, which is why it's always funny when sci-fi movies ask what the velocity of the spaceship is, and some guy says 22. But these are all metrics, perhaps not in the traditional sense. And so we're going to have thousands of these because we're going to have to instrument all this because we won't be able to have humans in the loop in all of these SSI 2.0 processes of the future and all of these tool chains of the future. It won't be possible. The only way it'll work, kind of like when we robotized car assembly lines, is with this automation with these guardrails, with these if-then-elses. And then someone will have to think about, well, what are all the reasons why I might not want this 
artifact, let's say it's a piece of software, to go from this step to the next step. Okay, I did everything I thought of today, but then something went farther down the line, and remember one of our metrics from earlier, an escape event, something got past where it should have gotten because we should have detected an error earlier, shift left and all. And so now this if then else needs to be updated to account for yet another thing. And there's gonna be hundreds and thousands of these in large enterprises across lots of value streams. This whole new era of metrics is gonna catch a lot of people by surprise. And the idea that one is one and zero is zero, and if it's not one and it's not zero, then it doesn't exist, is really gonna hurt a lot of people who are used to kind of flying by the seat of their pants. Trust in their gut because the bot doesn't care about your gut. Either it's zero or it's one or it didn't happen. And so really getting into what do we want to happen here and why and turning it into binary is gonna be a really big deal it's going to catch a lot of organizations by surprise. They won't know how to do this. And it's going to be a long and painful road if they don't get started on it now. Thank you for answering our questions. Uh, we will be posting this up as a companion for one of our stories in a four-part series on metrics. Sammy, thank you so much for sitting with us virtually and talking about metrics. Thank you very much for having me. I, I always appreciate it. It's a great conversation. <laughs>